Rolling. All right, 51.1. I guess we'll start as we have the past couple weeks with a uh, poop report. Had an awesome bout of uh, runny poo right before coming in. So my, my poop hamper right here is all flat. 15 consecutive months of, actually no, 17 months of, of uh, runny poo ever since Trump got elected. Uh, so thank you, Mr. President, for helping me uh, maintain a uh, flat tummy. I, 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 by the way, I never agreed to these reports. This is really Rick's idea. <laughs> I'm trying to keep this show elevated, all right? So anyway, um, I thought I would mention something to Rick. There is actually a show. Oh, oh, can, we, can you give us a quick art report? Oh, you wanted an art report. Um, what's happening is this. I'm trying to keep the painting going part by part. Now we're, we're down to this. We're down to this part right here. So if I can get this part settled, we're uh, this quarter or eighth of Rick. I think we're we're done with the hard part. And uh, today I'm just going to work on his hand, which is fun for me. And my philosophy when it comes to hands, and the reason why my hands are admired throughout the art world is because I spend as much time on the hands as I do on the heads. Most people are head hunters; they do a head. They slap the anatomy together, but they they make the hands fluid, meaning loose, meaning roughly painted. And they, actually, in the history of art, there were not a lot of artists that really went crazy on the detailing of the hands. In fact, some of the greatest artists, like Van Dyck and Velazquez, deliberately painted the hands very loosely to indicate motion. All right, so it would look like the hands were slightly out of focus mm. because that would indicate motion. They figured that out. We see that in animation today, but they knew it even hundreds of years ago. Mm. So to render out a hand very accurately is more of a different tradition, the Dutch tradition and the, and the, the tradition of Jose de Ribera, the uh, 17th century master. Not Diego Rivera? Not Diego Rivera. No, it's, it's good that I make that distinction. Diego Rivera was a Marxist uh, uh, Mexican painter in the 1930s uh, who was of limited talent, in my opinion. Jose de Rivera oh, was... And also Frida Kahlo's man boy. Okay. Uh, and uh, Jose de Ribera was the greatest painter of all time. He was a Spanish artist of the 17th century. He was considered the Spanish Rembrandt. And he was probably without, without a lot of uh, disagreement, the greatest painter of hands. One more thing is, yeah. you're working against time with each part of me because you're using paint that dries over the course of I don't well know, we, don't have, we don't have to get no, i'm just saying that, that's, that's there is a there's a time on. you got to get it done i like to work while the paint is still wet so i'm trying to make sure that it stays nice and fluid because once it seizes up and starts drying uh it's uh it's really hard to get those soft blends and make things look real because one once the I think that gets the point across. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I want to go back to this other issue, and that is that um, I was looking around on the internet because, you know, I I uh, I heard that Rick was being interviewed by the Mega Society or someone doing something about the Mega Society. Well, now that you've mentioned Kevin, this this is Kevin, who is working on a project involving the members of the Mega Society. Who, the Mega Society is an organization that was formed in the, uh, around 1986, where you needed a one in a million IQ to join. And 
some of the members are interesting. Um, I'm a lunatic. There are other people who, I've got a theory of the universe. I, I, I've been a comedy writer. Um, there's a guy who's currently, a member who's currently in FBI custody for uh, running a cult, including celebrity sex slavery. And if this thing gets picked up, it's probably because of celebrity sex slavery. Um, a, a cast member from Smallville, um, uh, an actress, got sucked in and was trying to recruit other people, including uh, Harry Potter's Emma Watson. I just want to say, if they want to try and recruit me, I'm interested in the process of recruiting to be in that sex cult. And, I, and, I, and I'm, I'm likely to be very cooperative. I'm probably an easy sell. Well, uh, you have to get branded. Smart, and it was him and all women. Yeah. And so, he. I don't think you're eligible. He branded his sex slaves. Yeah. He took a hot hanger and well, went. He didn't. Or I guess they. Some, well, you know better. One of his underlings did perform the branding. Well, look, all I can say is this. If he's willing to, if he can get several women to put up with that, then he is one of the smartest men in the world. He because, also got... Because I, I can't even get away with wearing the wrong shoes. Okay? So clearly this guy, do, I, I, will, I believe in him. He is not a fraud. He's probably the truest member of the mega society, the most, the most talented of all of them. If, if, if he can get away with that... Well, he um, didn't just get away with that. He got uh, some of his cult members to give him control of more than $100 million to invest for them. And he, he uh, it with, uh, fairly f uh, rapidly lost all that frickin' money. Yeah. I, 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 you know what? I have limitless admiration for this guy. The more you talk to him, the more you talk about him. I think he should be. Uh, a, 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 he should be, have a cult. I mean, if, if you can get a woman to just not slap you, I think that's, that's, uh, that takes a genius right there. So I'm impressed. All right, but anyway, I was looking around on the internet and because, all right, if Rick, the, the guy with the... Uh, with the bowel problems is uh, going to be in the Mega Society documentary, and I wanted to know more about this 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 manner of man that I've been working with. And the first thing I came to when I typed in Rick Rosner was uh, a page that had on it greatest 37 geniuses of all time, and uh, it didn't have his name. But when I looked when I watched the documentary, Rick was listed as a fraud. So, um, so I, you called me quite <laughs> upset. <laughs> I, I said, Rick, I, I charge you with not being one of the 37 smartest men of all no, time. No, no, no. All you. this time, I was, I was your bitch. I was letting you brand me naked. I was giving you all of $100 million, and now it turns out it's all, it's all a lie. Well, no, you actually called up upset on my behalf because you're my friend. When, when we're not yelling at each other on camera, we're actually friends with each other. And you were a, a, a little just sad that like somebody is, is calling me bullshit on the internet. I was. So right. can you respond to that? Yeah, and I got to say that everyone should Google Rick Rosner. Um, and you'll see a lot of scathing takedowns of me. Um, and this is one of them, and to help with my response, I, I transcribed the uh, pertinent passage from this uh, website. This is called... I hold it in this hand. All right, okay. Uh, it's called IQ 200 Plus, Smartest Person Ever, and it's from a YouTube channel called Human Chemistry 101. And this has been viewed by more than 1.1 million people. Mm. 
and it shows a list of the 37 smartest people in history. And the author begins with the three people at the bottom. And he says this, the first three on the list, the bottom three, Chris Langan, Marilyn Savant, and Rick Rosner can all be classified as what might be called IQ obsessives, people who have spent their entire lives learning how to take and be good at IQ tests and who've gone on to figure out ways to convert various combined IQ scores into fictitious 200 range IQs and then go on television and brag to everyone they are the smartest person in the world. All three, Savant, Langan, and Rosner, were all college dropouts who've never proved anything intellectual but who are connected by the fact that in the 80s and 90s they were part of American philosopher Ronald Hofflin's mega society and worked as volunteer editors of the society's monthly journal and have taken and retaken Hofflin's 48 question math and verbal IQ test and have convinced themselves that each of their IQs is above 200. And then they show a clip of me in a Domino's commercial where they say, you know, I've got the world's highest IQ of 200. I've never claimed to have an IQ of 200. The highest I've ever gotten on a test is 199. But they needed to round it to 200 because Domino's had done a taste test versus sub... They were, had, had come out with a new line of, sub, of Domino's sandwiches, which are freaking delicious. Everybody should eat them. And they'd found out that uh, people preferred Domino's sandwiches to Subway sandwiches two to one. The same way a, a 200 IQ is double the average IQ of 100. That was the point they were trying to make. Two to one preferred these sandwiches. And the, the, the ad only ran for a couple weeks before Subway threatened to take legal action because they said that, hey, your, your Domino sandwiches only have delicious things on them like cheese and pepperoni. But when they tested the Subway sandwiches, they put all this healthy shit on them like green peppers and lettuce, which are not delicious. And Subway said, you, that's not a fair test. So they took the ad off the air. Sad. Rick, I just want to mention, that proves you're not a fraud. Thank you for pointing these things out. Thank you. It was, it was Hollywood who was manipulating, gave me an extra IQ point. Okay. And th then he says, to take an example of this, claiming to have an IQ over 200, Rosner professed to have an IQ of 250 when, at age 26, he returned to high school and started taking classes. He says, I got good grades in most of my courses due to my advanced age compared to my classmates. I had a functional IQ of about 250. Now, of, yeah, because I was 26 in high school and going to school with people who were, you know, from age 15 to, to 18. Yeah, I had, and in my memoir, which somebody should publish someday, I describe it like this. I'm not like most 17-year-olds that I'm going to high school with. I've read 2,057 books, wrecked four cars, been to seven shrinks, memorized 105 digits of pi and 40 powers of two, roller skated across LA looking for a job in porn, burned my dick with a wood-burning tool to avoid having sex, scored in the 99.987th percentile of the SAT, banged women in an elevator in a graveyard in hot tubs and hotel rooms, and been naked in public 450 times. I have a body crisscrossed with eight feet of Rambo-like scars, a compulsion to only turn right, an IQ of 400, a theory that out Einstein's Einstein, and a plan to save the world. Because the guy is right that's trying to debunk me. You can play all sorts of games with IQ. Um, and when I said I had a functional IQ of 250, I meant I was like, I had way more life experience. And since I'd been to college for like six years before going back to high school for the last time, you know, I, I just, I knew everything. So yeah, I'm gonna be way, way smarter than uh, the average 
student in Albuquerque, New Mexico in 11th or 12th grade. Um, uh, back in Boulder, I was doing all sorts of like, I would do things that I thought might be funny or interesting, like take the SAT on LSD, or I went to a Mensa get together as a guy with an IQ of 76 to see if anybody noticed. I would just do exp social experiments. And I tried to convince a private junior high school when I was, I don't know, 22, to let me go back to eighth grade because I thought it would be ridiculous and possibly funny, which it turns out to be. When Adam Sandler did it in, was it Billy Madison? Uh, you know, he, it was funny. Um, and they wisely didn't let me go back to junior high. But had I gone back to junior high and was among 12-year-olds at the age of 22, then I would have been even smarter than I was relative to them than I would have been among 17-year-olds. If I'd managed to convince, to convince a kindergarten to let me go back in my early 20s, I would have known so much more than all the five-year-olds. And I would have had, compared to them, I would have had a functional IQ of at least 600 and maybe 800. Now that doesn't, am I claiming to have an IQ of, of 250 or 400? No, I'm making some kind of weird joke. So guy who was trying to take me down. No, I'm not claiming to have an IQ of 250. I'm just saying that at age 26, I was way smarter than a 17-year-old. Actually, would this be a good time for me to interject something? Yeah. Because you're kind of on a roll. Look, I'm, I'm being the audience right now. We have over 2 billion viewers, and I'm sure most of them are wondering, uh, so now you've shown that there is a certain humor element to your IQ history. But what exactly makes you of note? I mean, do you have any proof that you have a high IQ? Yeah. Now, the guy says, but, right. I mean, I, I can't entirely deny on Langan's behalf and Marilyn Savant's behalf, I will say that they are not people who spent their entire lives learning how to take and be good at IQ tests. Because they, they very intelligently took an IQ test or two or three, got a super high score, and then they quit because that's what you do. Because all you can, it's, it's pointless to keep taking IQ tests because you've gotten this super high score. Marilyn Savant was listed in the Guinness Book of World Records. Why would she want to take more IQ tests and possibly fuck them up and fuck up her reputation? So g listen, Get to the point. Well, no, hold on. So, but, but I stupidly, I was working in a tough job as a comedy writer where I would, uh, people would point out my ineptitude quite frequently. And I'd go home and I'd be like, uh, and I would, I would, I, among the three of us, Langan, Savant, and myself, I was the only one who, like, just kept taking IQ test after IQ test because I, I liked, like, doing really well at something. Um, and I took more than 30 tests, these high-end tests that are designed to measure IQs into the 180s, 190s, 200, and on at least 24 out of, I don't know, these 30-plus tests, I got the highest score ever achieved. I got the only perfect score on the Titan test, which uh, has been considered the hardest IQ test ever created. So in terms of taking tests, um, I kick ass. Now, does this translate into me being the smartest guy in the world? No. I mean, just look at me. We're doing this freaking thing. I'm not Terrence Tao, who's at UCLA, like doing, you know, super duper math every single day. Yeah, but, but wait a minute. Wait a minute. And so this is the part I don't understand about any of this. How is it possible that you could do that well on an IQ test and not be really, really brilliant? Well, I, I'm not stupid, except 
you know, in no, certain I mean, areas I mean, of life. Well, look, what, well, no, what I'm saying is this. Look, if somebody gave me the Titan test, I'd probably score better than average. And then uh, if I took it a week later, I'd score better than average and over and over again. I would never score perfect on the Titan test, whatever it is. So how, how could you score that high if you're not a genius? Here's what happened. Okay. Right before I turned 21, when I, when I was 10, I decided that my goal in life, that the only legitimate goal of a powerful thinker, that I, of the powerful thinker that I wanted to be, should be to figure out the universe. And I started trying to think about that, and I, I came up with a lot of bullshitty thoughts, as a 10-year-old would. And then, right before I turned 21, I had what I still think is uh, the, the impelling insight into the structure of the universe, that it has the same structure as the information within consciousness, that it's got the same physics, it's got the same geometry, and I've been thinking about it ever since often in a quite lazy way, but that's been my goal, is to turn that, take that theory to fruition. You're not answering my question. But hold on, no, I am, because I, at that point, I'd, al I'd already done quite a bit of fucking up, but that, like, crystallized my fucking up, or put it, like, made fucking up inconsequential to me, because as long as I was thinking about the theory, um, nothing else really, whatever else I did, didn't really matter. So I could do whatever the fuck I wanted, which included, you know, stripping and as long as, you know, I'd, I'd stand at the door of a bar and I'd, I'd do equations about, uh, you know, gravitational attenuation as you approach a, uh, the, a blackish hole. And as long as I was thinking about that, you know, every once in a while, then I could uh, go about my, everything else kind of, it was, it was, it, what do you call it when, like at the beginning of a Big Bang, when, the, the, when, a, when you break symmetry, symmetry broke. It's like people like to characterize the Big Bang as time begins when you have a pencil standing on end. It's unstable, it has to fall over, it's symmetrical when it's standing straight up. Because you look down on the top of it and you see a perfectly round little thing. But then it has to fall in some direction. It breaks symmetry. And then the whole universe is released as symmetry is broken. All these particles emerge out of this oneness. You know, this oneness becomes a bunch of differentness. But at age just about 21, my symmetry broke. And there was the one thing that I really needed to do, which is think about the universe. And then everything else kind of dropped to this, it didn't matter, you know, what I achieved or didn't achieve from day to day, month to month, as long as I was thinking about the theory. I, it, it, it fucked up me having other aspirations and gave me license to engage in nonsense. Got it. But why is it that you're able to do that well on the Titan test? Because as Fredo said in The Godfather, I'm schmott, I'm schmott, I'm not stupid, I'm schmott. And then, right. then he got shot in the head. Spoiler alert. I, I have just three quick okay. points. Um, number one, so just to piggyback on what Lance is saying, I have a, and I've shared this with you, Rick, I have a dear friend and she's a, She's an organic chemist. She's a PhD in chemistry, and she works for this really um, prestigious pharmaceutical company. Mm -hmm. Makes a ton of money, and she's really mad at you. I told you, right? She's yeah, because I've, I've wasted my freaking life on nonsense. <laughs> right. How, how, what, it, what would be your response to her? Why? I'm, I would say I'm still hoping that my theory... I'm, I'm highly confident that even if I'm not the one to bring my theory all the way to, to you know, what a full theory should be. I'm confident that it will be 
found to be correct, at least in part, that the arrow of time is connected to the loss of energy by long distance radiation, photons and neutrinos. There's, there's a dilemma in physics which says that if all the physics in the world is time reversible, that if running things backwards doesn't violate the rules of physics, and it doesn't, then why does time move forwards? And I would say, well, look at all the gazillion photons and neutrinos in the world that escape their local environment where they were created and go zipping across the universe for billions of light years, losing energy all along the way. Now that is a one-way process because when the photon finally arrives at some destination, it's energy depleted. It's shared energy and information with the whole rest of the universe, or a lot of the universe, on the way to, its, to where it eventually hits something. You know, even if it's at the, you know, the hot mess that is the outskirts of the universe. Um, and then a physicist could argue, well, if you ran the universe backwards, the whole frickin' universe, so instead of it being a red-shifted universe where everything's rushing apart, it's a blue-shifted universe where everything is rushing together, then yeah, that photon could show up at its destination with more energy than when it left but to which I would say, no, you can't run the universe backwards. You don't get a blue-shifted universe. You can get local blue-shifted areas that are gravitationally collapsing, but the principles of information don't allow you to run the entire universe backwards. And other principles, such as that entropy doesn't apply at the largest scales. You can hide entropy away. You can tuck it away. That the universe is not doomed to the heat death of entropy. Uh, that there are no black holes, there are only blackish holes. Because gravitation, like inertia, according to Mach's principle, is not just things collapsing, being pulled into themselves, it's things collapsing into themselves against the background of the whole rest of the universe. And when things go really collapsing, like black hole collapsy, that is that matter pulling way the F away from the rest of the universe, which actually tamps down the net gravitational attraction felt by the collapsing matter. All that stuff works, is, are, they're all aspects of a theory of the universe being a massive information processor. And if, and I believe, and this is where it's psycho because it, it's too grandiose a claim, but I believe that this is the last great theory before we merge with the frickin' robots. And everything changes. Whether I'm the one to bring it to completion or not, it's the last theory of unadulterated humanity. Challenge uh, anybody out there that wants to debunk your theory or wants to add to it to send the video in, or how, what would be the best way to? For I don't know. Like, like, if you're a physics dude and want to tell me I'm full of shit and, exp and get list like two dozen reasons, like when I edited this this journal that this guy talks about, um, people would send like retired high school teachers would send in like page after page of funky math trying to disprove Einstein. Um, it's a th certain people go crazy and try to, and start thinking that they have a theory that, that goes against other stuff. Now, I'm not so crazy that I think you can debunk Einstein, but I think that you can extend relativity. Far, there are two kinds of relativity, and I think you can extend them farther than they've gone so far. So I'm, so I'm not, a retired high school shop teacher who's saying relativity is bullshit. But I am saying, yeah, it's not complete. And physics professors are known, or know that physics professors 
a few times a year will have a lunatic show up in their office with some bad theory that, that, that uh, claims to overturn the world of physics and they claim they're being persecuted and there's a, prof a physics guy at UC Riverside, John Baez, who came with, up with a thing called the crackpot index where it's a set of 30 or 35 questions and it, you're supposed to take the test and the more yes answers you have, uh, the more crazy you likely are with your dumb theory. So, um, you know, I, I, I'd like to go meet with uh, Dr. Baez and he can tell me I'm crazy. Or if you out there are a physics professor, you know, we can you know, meet on Skype or if you're local in person and you can give me like 18 reasons in five minutes why my theory is bullshit. Or maybe I'll get lucky and you'll be like, yeah, okay, yeah. I mean, the one like reason and one thing in my favor is that the Big Bang is less than a hundred years old, the theory. It's the first complete theory of the universe based on fairly complete observational data from the entire universe. Because until the nineteen the teens, the nineteen twenties, the nineteen thirties, there there wasn't enough we didn't even know there were other galaxies until the beginning of the 20th century, the first half of the 20th century. And we didn't have a physical framework until general relativity, until people solved the equations of general relativity to allow for a Big Bang universe. And the idea that we would get a complete theory of the universe correct the first time, the odds of that are like nil. Um, two more things. He says I'm a college dropout, um, which is true. At age 26, I dropped out of college to go back to high school again. But at age 33, I went back to college and I earned 12 years of college credit in 11 and a half months. I, by taking tests, I took the subject tests of the GRE which is what you take when you want to be a grad student. After you've studied a subject, and you want to be, go for a, an MA or a PhD in that subject, you take the subject tests of the GRE to show that you're proficient in that field enough to go to grad school. I took, that, I took 12 of those subject tests, and I scored in the 70th to 98th percentile in frickin' all of them, and I got 360 semester units of credit in 50 weeks. And can and, you prove this? Oh yeah, I've got all the test results. Nobody else has ever frickin' done that. That's a, a thing. At an accredited school. Okay. All right, what else? Um, oh, like it says, uh, duh, 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 who've never proved anything intellectual. Um, well, I've got this theory. I haven't proved it. It may be bullshit, but I have freaking worked on 2,500 written and produced for 2,500 hours of broadcast television for all major networks. Been nominated for seven Writers Guild Awards and an Emmy. Um, you were nominated for an Emmy? Yeah. No, it was part of an ensemble. It was all the writers uh -huh. on Kimmel who That's got good. nominated. But still, I, I've had a successful many decades long career writing uh, more than 110,000 jokes for TV, thousands of which made it onto TV. And the greatest achievement may be having gotten Trump elected. you want to expand on that? Uh, well, I, I wrote, it is said that Trump got, Trump had considered running for president uh, several times before, 88, 92, and then he, he, he quit running you know, before it got serious. But it's said that when Seth Meyers um, roasted him at a White House correspondence dinner, it was so vicious and he got so pissed that he decided he was going to run. Um, and I didn't write a, a joke for that dinner, but I 
contributed a joke for another correspondence dinner that he was in attendance at, and it was at his expense. I don't remember the joke, but it may have added to his grievances against the, the political process. So, wow. That's a brush with history. Yeah, so I'm, a, I'm sorry, but I am paying the price by, by pooping all the frickin' time. All right, we should move on to something else. And just lastly, in terms of the, do we want to name this guy who he is? This I don't know, I just, I mean, go to Human Chemistry 101. He's some guy who I, whom, who I believe uh, has some theory of what makes humans human. I don't know. You don't want to like... I don't know his name. Or or uh, he's got something he calls the Homolpedia. H-M-O-L-P... E D I A or something like that. Cool. All right.